Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Quay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, the one and only Jordan Maxwell returns to the show. For this discussion, Jordan will offer his insights into the origins of Judaism, along with his thoughts on whether humanity can overcome the matrix. And so without further ado, here's Jordan Maxwell. Jordan, thank you very much for coming back on the show. Every time you're on, my audience loves listening to you. When I was getting into research and looking into conspiracies and the such many years ago, uh, you were such a great source of information. And so it's always a pleasure when you're on my show because uh, you are one of my teachers. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's very kind of you. Absolutely. And so tonight, I know that you want to talk a little bit about Judaism because you're an expert in religion and uh, talk about some of the aspects of Judaism, some of the stories, some of the players and the background. And I think this is going to be uh, a very informative discussion for our audience. Many times, you know, a lot of there'll be a lot of talk about Christianity and talk about Islam, but you don't really get a lot of discussion about Judaism. So that's why I think tonight is going to be um, a great conversation. So with that, because I'm going to learn a lot tonight also, where would you like to start? Well, goodness. where would you start on something so incredible <laughs> and so hard to believe? Uh, everybody's heard me talk about the unfortunate condition that the church and Christianity finds itself in today. The church and Christianity in general is really uh, uh, an incredible story of betrayal that uh, the, the Christian people, there's so many good people out there that are Christians. My, my mother and my family were Christians and I was born a Christian. So I'm not complaining about the Christian people. I'm talking about Christianity as a philosophy, as a concept and an idea, uh, and, 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 the, and the history of, of the whole operation. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the people, because good people have been, have been, you know, for thousands of years in history, good people have been doing the best they can to do what they, you know, to do what they can for God. And so I respect that, and I have the highest admiration for the idea of God and for the idea of great spirituality. But the history of Christianity, and point of fact, most of it you never heard. I like what President Truman, the 33rd president of the United States, he said, the only, uh, somebody said to him that uh, the Bible says that there's nothing new under the sun. And Truman said, actually, the only thing that's really new under the sun is all the information you don't know nothing about. <laughs> that's the only thing that's new, is the real truth of what's going on in this world. Of the three religions, I would say, why are there three religions? Because you got Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You know, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Osiris, Isis, Horus, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You have three because triune gods as the foundation for all religions in the world. I don't care what it is. It's the triune god, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, right. and India, or Osiris, Isis, and Horus, the triune god of, of, of uh, Egypt. And then the Jews have uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Christians have uh, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Nobody's ever thought, how come all religions of the world have three main parts to it? And all three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, are referred to in academia as the people of the book. The people of the book are the Arabic world, the Jewish world, and the Christian world. They are referred to as the people of the book. Why? Because their whole life, and their religion is based on a book. So they're the people of the book. Without the book, they ain't got nothing. <laughs> and so, yeah, they don't. I mean, what, what, what do Islam, what does Islam have without the book? Yeah. They got the Quran. That's the very word of God. Thank God, because without that, you got nothing, right? And then, of course, if you find out the Jesuits wrote the, you know, the Islamic book, and there was no Muhammad, it never lived, there was no such a man named Muhammad, and then it was the Jesuits that wrote the damn book. And so when I remember growing up, I used to hear, hear people say all the time, maybe you heard it too, that in this, in this house we don't discuss religion or politics. 
Yep. We don't discuss religion politics. So I used to think, uh, you know, as a kid, I used to think, well, that's because you might offend uh, your, your neighbors or offend your friends uh, coming over there a different religion, and we don't want to offend them. No, I know now why you don't discuss religion and politics, because those are the two dirtiest things that are going on on the earth today. We're talking child porn, money, graft, corruption, wars, violence, drug addiction. That's the bottom line. That's why we don't want to talk about it in a mixed company. We don't want to hear about all the incredible atrocities going through the Vatican, all the all the murder and the bloodshed and the throat of people with their throats cut, and all the homosexual rings inside the Vatican, and all the buying and selling of children, and and and, and it's incredible criminality. But that's why we don't talk about uh, uh, religion and politics in this house. Why? Because we don't want to talk about that stuff. That makes people uncomfortable. We don't want to make un people uncomfortable. So we want to talk about nice things, about the football game and basketball game and uh, and Paris Hilton and other things. So we don't have to hear about all that other dirty stuff that's destroying your world and you don't even know it. So I, I began to wonder, why is there three major religions? And why do all the religions have three main gods? So... <laughs> And so I would say, first of all, with Islam, you have to uh, to understand the darkness that we call Islam and where it really came from, and all all the symbols, what they actually, in fact, mean. Why is it Mecca? Uh, why why do we call that city Mecca? And and in Mecca there's a a, a square black building called the Kaaba, uh, which goes back to the Jewish Kabbalistic. Uh, interpretations of spirituality. Kaaba, Kabbalism. Christianity is on the one hand very saintly and very holy in its presentation to the world. I mean, I've been to Vatican, I've been all through the Vatican, and it's a very impressive, you know, feeling you get there. It's the sense of world Christianity until you find out what the Vatican really is and what's actually going on there that you didn't know anything about. And so I consider Christianity to be a very, uh, very sorrowful uh, predicament. It's a very, very hurtful and sorrowful feeling I get about Christianity because there's so many good people. So many good people have given their life and their money and their whole life to Christianity and, and did so many wonderful things in their life because of Christianity but never, ever knew what the real story of Christianity really was and where it came from and how it got to be so popular. Uh, people don't know what happened in Europe. They don't know what happened in Asia and, and, and Iraq and Iran and all those different places of the world where religions were very powerful. And so <clears throat> I feel very sorry for Christianity, and we could talk about that for days if you want. But uh, but uh, on the other hand, my feeling about Judaism is Judaism is actually rather fascinating and interesting and kind of funny, kind of humorous, actually. Uh, if you go back, I mean, some of it is really very heavy duty stuff. But uh, but then there is some it does have its high points in, 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 in humor. Uh, and the kind of thing I'm talking about, I can give you all kinds of, uh, of examples, but one of them is in the book of uh, uh, the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, and supposedly Moses wrote the Pentateuch, right? Well, first of all, we now know there was no Moses. He never existed. So there was no Jesus, because Jesus never existed. This is why I'm trying to tell people don't plan your life on Jesus coming back because it's very difficult to come back to some place you've never been to start with. <laughs> <laughs> so he's not only not coming back, but he never was here to begin with. Yeah. So how is he going to come back? So this is why even the Vatican is now saying that about a year ago, the Vatican came out with a little, a little Mickey Mouse piece in the paper. I and remember that. It, 
Yeah, and he said, well, maybe Jesus is not coming back. Maybe we miscalculated. The Pope said, no, I think we probably have miscalculated and that Jesus isn't coming back. I wanted to scream in his face, you damn well know it ain't coming back. The whole thing was a crock and bowl story from day one. But it's based on something far, far more uh, important. It's, Christianity is based on astrotheology. And most people don't know anything about astrotheology, thanks to the church, because the church makes sure you don't know anything about astrotheology and all the sacred science. All you got to do is listen for about 15 minutes to uh, Santos Bonacci, and that will blow your mind. Yep. When he starts un un uh, unfolding the, all the dark intricacies of the ancient world and their comprehension of the universe and how the stars and the moon and the planets all play a part in the mythology of life, there's a real story. And so, but as I said, Judaism is, for me, uh, it's, it's, it's fun to, to go through and look at because it's funny. For instance, we're told that Moses, uh, in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, it says, I think it's in Genesis, maybe not, maybe it's Exodus. But uh, an incident we know there was no Moses, so Moses didn't write the, the first five books of the Bible. And if you have any question about that, go to the very last book of the Pentateuch, go to the fifth book. At the end of the fifth book, where Moses supposedly been writing the five books, well, at the end of the fifth book, there's a whole couple of chapters where it talks about what happened after Moses died. Yes. Yep. You know, and after he died, uh, Moses, uh, the, the people did this, the people did that, and the, and the kings did this. The, the king, uh, How would Moses know all of that if he's dead? And why are they writing it all? <laughs> and so then you figure out, no, no, some, somebody's fooling with us. But in the Bible, the Pentateuch, there's a, there's a scripture that says that uh, Moses confronted God and asked God if he could see him. And uh, I think a lot of people probably remember some part of that, that Moses asked God, can I see you? I mean, I've been worshiping you and doing all these things for you. Uh, would you let me see you? And the scripture says, <clears throat> God said, no, I cannot let you see me because any man who sees me must die. I'm God and you cannot see me. But God went on to say, however, since you have been so faithful and you have been so good uh, i'll tell you what i'll do i'm going to pull my pants down and you can see my ass what how's that would you like to see my butt i'll pull my pants down and you can see my butt uh but you can't see my face you ain't good enough to see my face but since you've been so loyal i'll let you see my butt how how's that would you like that <laughs> yeah and so moses said oh yeah anything so it said so then god tells moses all uh, right, go behind those big rocks over there. Go uh, get behind the rocks because I'm so glorious that I'm going to scare you if you see me. <laughs> and then when I give you the whistle, I'll whistle and, uh, and I'll pull my pants down and you can see my butt. And, uh, and so just remember, you saw God. And so it says, and so God pulled his pants down and told and give him a whistle. And he peeped out from behind the rock and see God in his butt. I just think that's funny. So God mooned Moses, basically. That's right. <laughs> no, that's exactly correct. Now, why do you have the word moon? Kids that stick their butt out in a car uh, as teenagers, we call it mooning. They're mooning you. Why is that called mooning? Yeah. Very important. It's called mooning because Moses was a uh, a leader of a lunar cult. He was a worshiper of the moon. So actually he was a moon personality because Moses in history never lived. There was no such a man, Moses, even today in Israel. And the Jewish uh, theologians today in Israel are writing a lot of books. And I talk with a lot of them and they're writing books saying there was no Moses. And, and today it's becoming overwhelmingly obvious in Israel because of the professors and scientists and doctors who are talking about this, that there was no ancient Israel. It never existed. Uh, Judaism is not a B.C. religion. We, we say it's a B.C. and the B.C.E. before a common era. Right. 
Judaism did not exist in the B.C. It was developed in the early part of the A.D., right around the 8th, 9th, and 10th century A.D. It's the idea introduced into the world of academia that there was an ancient people called the Israelites. But because, but before the 8th and 9th, 10th century A.D., there was no discussion of ancient Israel. There was no ancient Israel. It never existed. So once you see that and understand that the Judaism today is actually the uh, a product of the Knights Templars, a Masonic order of Knights Templars out of the Catholic Church. Uh, they were very prominent during the 13th century when Pope uh, Innocent, the, what a hell of a name for a Pope, Pope Innocent, uh, sent the Crusaders into the Middle East for the Crusades. Well, he had an army. He had a, he had the papal army, which was the Knights Templars or the Knights of the Temple of Solomon. They were a militaristic Masonic order. There was a, a fraternal order of men who were supporting the church and the Pope. And so they were called Knights of the Temple or the Knights of the, of the Temple of Solomon. And so... When, when, the, when the Knights Templars came up with the idea of, of taking the, the, the religion of the Catholic Church, the Vatican religion of so-called Christianity, but they realized that if you're going to hoodwink the whole world, if you're going to sell the whole world on the fact that Christianity is the bottom line, that Jesus is the bottom line, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to provide the world with some legitimate foundations for why Jesus is God and Jesus is the bottom line of the whole world and Christianity and the Pope rules the whole universe. What is the basis for you saying that? Where did you come from? You know, <laughs> Who was your father and mother? Who, where did you come from? Telling me that you control the whole universe? Right. You know, my, my dad knew you when you were a kid. <laughs> and uh, and so what is the basis for your saying that you are the, the Vatican and you are the Pope and that you claim that you are the supreme ruler of the world? Where did you get all that crap? Who, who put this into your head? And so the Knights Templars, the Masonic Lodge in the, in the Masonic Lodge in the Catholic Church, they realize that you've got to give the world a foundation on which to, to base your government, your, 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 your religion. And so the Rome was known all over the world for what Rome was. And no, nobody believes the Lord uh, loved the Romans and the Lord loved uh, Rome and let Rome murder and rape and kill and destroy all peoples of the world. And so you've got to give Rome a, a, something more uh, specific to base their religion on. So the Knights Templars came up with the idea of Judaism. Judaism would be the first. It would be based on the ancient Jewish people and the ancient laws of, of, of God written in the Holy Scriptures, etc. And then from there comes Jesus, the Messiah, based on ancient Jerusalem and the ancient teachings of the prophets, etc. And now it begins to take on uh, a different kind of feeling. It's, uh, this is a very important movement in the world with Christianity based on ancient Ju Judaism and all of that. So now it begins to be more tenable and more important. It never happened. There was no ancient Judaism. There was no ancient Israel. There was no ancient King Solomon, the King David. None of those people ever existed. It was just a story. But if you go back into the early Middle Ages when most people couldn't read, and most people in Europe couldn't read or write, and it was only the priest in the Catholic Church who were a privilege to be able to learn how to read and write and talk about this kind of stuff in private in the monasteries and in, and in the Vatican behind closed doors. And so they built up a story about ancient Israel and the ancient Israeli people and the ancient Jews and all that stuff. And they were kicked out of, uh, out of you know, they said, Moses said, let my people go. And, and uh, and and so all these wonderful stories based on God's working with the human family, and then you find out no, it's just a bunch of stories. Period. That's all it is, just a story. And so the Knights Templar, they actually created Judaism around what 1000 CE or AD? Is that what you're saying? I would say I would say earlier, 
Maybe 8th, 9th, and 10th century a A.D. Okay. is when the whole idea began to develop to come up with a story to base Christianity on. Because if you're just going to base it on the coming of Rome and the Vatican, well, hell, everybody in town knows about Rome and the Vatican. We Everybody knows that. All the mafia, mafia guys, all the mob guys in Chicago mob and the Detroit mob and, and New York, they're all good Roman Catholics. You know, everything takes place in the Vatican. So everybody knows what's going on in the Vatican. It's all mafia. It's all underworld organization, buying and selling children, dope, drugs, and killing people. Everybody knows that. But what have you got to say about your religion that, that has some validity, has something truly spiritual about it? Well, we base it on, on God's chosen people, the chosen people of the Lord, or the Jews. And then you come to find out, well, first of all, there were no Jews. <laughs> it's, uh, they were Phoenician Canaanites and, and all the lectures that, that are coming out of, uh, uh, out of the big universities back east. Now on the, on the web, uh, these university, uh, courses on the, on the history of the ancient world are all saying the same thing. That there, there, there was no ancient history of the ancient Jews because there were no ancient Jews. There was no ancient Israel. And so I would say that Judaism is funny. It, it's, it's got a lot of hilarious, funny things about it when you see what the words actually mean. For instance, we talk about how when the king and queen and, and, and royalty in the world today, uh, they say that they have a divine right of kings, yeah. Well, that's that's interesting where that comes from. It goes back to reptilian stuff, and we could talk about that later. But for today, when kings and queens are are crowned <clears throat> like they were at one time in in Europe and France and Germany, but today we still have king and queens in England. But when the queen is uh, or the king is crowned uh, into royalty to become the king or queen. Uh, the system is that they uh, have uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury has this big bowl of oil, uh, of oil, and a big, huge silver spoon. That's why they're born with a silver spoon in their mouth, right? It's because it's a big silver spoon, and he takes this in the, in, in the temple and in the church, and he pours some of the oil on the queen's head, and she is now anointed. And so this is where you get the word of Christo. Christ, uh, Jesus the Christ is Jesus the anointed one. Anointed comes from the word Christo in Greek. Christo, Christo in Greek is what we have today, a cooking oil called Crisco. Crisco cooking oil comes from the Greek word Christo. Christo is oil. And, and so if, <laughs> yeah, if you pull in the service station and eat oil, you ask for some Christo. And Christo is oil. And so why? Because the Christians will tell you the oil is a symbol of the anointing of a king. Well, no, it's just the pouring oil in his head. Well, yeah, but we call that <laughs> anointing. Well, it takes some of the luster out of the word Christo, doesn't it? We yeah. Talk about Crisco. <laughs> that's, the kind of, that's what I'm talking about. It's funny. And then when you say, well, wait a minute. If you are pouring oil on the queen's head or the king's head, and then you tell me that that's anointing him. Do you know what the word anointing means in the old Phoenician language? What the anointing? Anointing is sex. Sex act is called in the ancient world anointing. That's why the kings would all, always anoint the young women uh, because he was uh, he was the big he was the big man in town. For there's going to be any any weddings or any sex or anything, the king is he plays first, <laughs> and so and so that's why yeah, and so that's where we get the word anointing. Anointing was pouring oil on a male phallic. This is what they used to do in the ancient Roman Empire before sex. Men would pour oil on their on their penis, and it was lubricating, and uh, and so it was referred to in the Roman Latin. Uh, the man was uh, was anointing himself before sex. So he was pouring oil on the head, and so this is why today, when you're anointed, the king, who's the big, who's the big, uh, he's the big shot in town. They're pouring oil on his head 
No, it's symbolic for pouring oil on the head of the penis. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, and that's where it comes from. We look it up in the dictionary. Look up the word anointing in the Bible dictionaries and Bible concordances and all the, you know, go to any good Bible uh, seminary and, and or bookstore and look up the word anointing. It will tell you just pouring oil on the head of the penis before sex. And this is why if you're going to be a preacher, you're going to be a, a minister in the Christian religion, you've got to go to a seminary. Get it? Yeah. Yeah. And so now you're going to a seminary to get anointed. We're talking sex here, period. And so then with the anointing, then we come to Moses with the, uh, the children of Israel, and he provides them with uh, the manna from heaven. Remember the Jews have the manna from heaven? Yes. Well, you go look at the encyclopedias of religion, dictionaries of religion, uh, the different Jewish uh, reference works, their concordances, all of those uh, old reference works of the rabbis and read them. I, I didn't write them. I'm just reading them and telling you what they say. And, that, uh, and so when Moses was... Uh, Ask God to feed the, the, the Hebrew people, to feed the intra Israelites. And so God looked down and saw that Israelites were poor and didn't have anything to eat. So he gave them something called manna from heaven. And so they would go out every morning and there would be all the little manna from heaven and pick it and eat it. And they would syrup on it or, or honey or whatever. And that's how they lived. They ate the manna from heaven. Until you go back to the reference works like I do and read about the manna from heaven, you find out they're magic mushrooms, uh -huh. period. And they were referred to in the Hebrew, the old Hebrew tograms and the old rabbinical authorities would write about the manna from heaven. It's all right there in the Jewish encyclopedias and the Jewish dictionaries. And it says that the manna from heaven were little round uh, wafer type of things that would grow in the morning dew uh, because in the night the dew would be on the ground but in the morning these little round wafer things would grow and they, they looked like mushrooms. No, they didn't look like mushrooms. They were mushrooms. <laughs> and so that's what and so then now that now there's a lot of books coming out in Israel, some really interesting articles coming out in their magazines and books now in Israel talking about Moses was on drugs. The whole thing was all, uh, the manna from heaven was nothing more than mushrooms. And, 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 and so, well, I'm the one that started talking about that back in 1980, about Moses with, uh, was pushing mushrooms. Again, Moses never lived. There was no such a man named Moses. But, uh, Moses was a name in, in Egypt for a, uh, one of the prophets of the lunar god. And so today, the, the moon is still a very important god in Judaism. But Judaism is now made up of three separate religions, three separate gods at three separate times in history. Back in the Mosaic times, when Moses would have been alive, he never was here, but the time when he would have been alive, all of the Middle East was worshiping a moon god, and, and, and his name was Allah. And so the Hebrews have a god called Yahweh. Well, now you find out Yahweh is Hebrew for God, but Allah is Arabic for God. So Arabic and Hebrew are very close alike. So now we find out Allah and Yahweh is the same God, the moon. Now, if you is standing on the Sinai, uh, if you're standing on the uh, in Egypt side of Sinai, if you're standing in Egypt, you, and you stand in Egypt and you look eastward, you look eastward, uh, you're looking over into the Sinai, and in the middle of the Sinai are very high mountain ranges, very high mountains in the Sinai. And so every evening about 6 o'clock, the moon, if you're standing there facing east, uh, facing the east, the moon comes up from the mountain. Well, of course, the moon rises every evening at 6 o'clock. This is why today the Jews would tell you they have a, uh, lunar calendar. They don't count by, by the solar. They have a lunar calendar. Why? Because that's what they're worshiping as the moon. 
And so the moon god, his name, look it up in the dictionary. It is very simple. Go look in the dictionary. Look up the word sin, S-I-N. This is not doing something bad like in Christianity is a sin. No, no. S-I-N was the name of the god in Arabia, and he was the god of the moon. And so he was referred to as the moon god, Allah. Allah is the moon god, or Yahweh. Yahweh is the moon god. But his original name in the ancient Sumerian was Sin, S-I-N. And the mountain was A-I. In the ancient language, A-I was, was a word for a mountain. So the god who lived in the mountain, obviously the moon god lives in the mountain. That's obvious, because every night that's where he comes up from. He's been sleeping all day. And now he comes up from the mountain at 6 o'clock, and that's why today Jews have their holy days after 6 o'clock in the evening. It's from evening to evening is their day. Why? Because the moon comes out at 6. And so they don't, have a, they don't have their holy days during the day when the Christianity does, because Christians are worshiping God's Son, the, whole, the, the light of the world. The Son, S-U-N, not S-O-N. And so the Christians are worshiping the S-U-N, thinking it's S-O-N, but it isn't. And so now the Jews are worshiping the moon, and that's why they have their holy days after sundown, because that's when the moon comes out. And so the, the moon god was named Sin, and he obviously lived in a mountain, because every night you can see him come up at 6 o'clock, he, he wakes up and comes out, and so he lives in the mountain. And the mountain is Ai. So you put them both together, it becomes Sinai. S-I-N-A-I. Okay. The Mount Sinai, the holy of holy mountains of the world, is Mount Sinai. No, it's Sin Ai. Goofy, wake up, <laughs> go back, and, and, and do something really strange. Get an education. Go back and read a book and understand you've been had. So it's not... The great Mount Sinai. No, it's Sin Ai, the mountain of the moon god. And so the moon god was called Sin. Sin, or Yahweh, or Allah, whatever you want to call the Arabic moon god, was a moon god. And so therefore, when, when God is telling Moses, I'll bend over and you can see my butt. He was mooning Moses, and that's why today we have that thing where kids call it mooning somebody. Why? Because Moses was a lunar or moon worshiper. And he and all the people who were worshiping the moon in the Middle East, we call God's chosen people, the Jewish people. They followed Moses. No, there was no Moses. It's a story. That's why the Bible's called the greatest story ever told. It's not the greatest collection of historical facts ever assembled. No, it's just a story. Yeah. But well, once you understand the story, it becomes funny. God pulls his pants down and lets let Moses see his butt, and that, and that should suffice. That's as good as you're going to get. Don't, don't ask for anything more. <laughs> you get the best you're going to get, son. I'll go away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so then when, and then you find out Moses is, is feeding, God's feeding his, his chosen people with mushrooms. And then, uh, then you find out that uh, Christianity has got Brahma. I mean, Hindus got Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. And then the Egyptians have got Osiris, Isis, Horus. And the Christians have got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then I talk with the rabbis. They say, give me a break. We've got to have a religion, too, for God's sake. Everybody's got a religion. So the rabbis said, we've got to have a religion, too. So we got three gods, too. It's uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I said, was there an Abraham, an Isaac, or Jacob? And they said, I don't know. Was there a Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva? Was there an Osiris, Isis, Horus? I don't know. Well, we don't know either. That's all we know is uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then you look at, then you go to the next step and, and find out that all three religions, Christianity, Judaism, and, and, and Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, all three will tell you that their father is Abraham. Abraham was the father of uh, the whole uh, Semitic world. He was, the, he was the closest thing to God. Well, first of all, there was no Abraham. No such man ever existed in history. 
There's no telephone book or an address book with a man named Abraham ever in the Old Testament of the world. So just understand that it's just a story. There was no Abraham. But if you go back to where the Judaism actually began, the Jewish religion actually, in point of fact, scientifically, we can prove, goes back to India. The Hindus gave birth to what we call Judaism. It's a Hindu religion. Well, if you go back to the Hindu today, even today, there is still an ancient, very ancient uh, priesthood in India called the Brahmins. Brahman was a word, was a word for God, Brahma. And so the Brahmins said, what they said in history, and you can read it in any history book on the Brahmins, they said that they were God's chosen people. They were a chosen race and a chosen priesthood. Well, that's what, the, that's what the Jews are saying today, that they're God's chosen people. But they're not the first ones. The Brahmins said that. The Brahmins are famous for saying that they are a chosen priesthood. And they wouldn't have anything to do with, with the people they call the untouchables. Uh, with their normal, everyday uh, Joe Sickpeck and his wife, you will not be in the Brahmins' company. They want nothing to do with you. You're like a Gentile. You're, you're worse than a, a cow or a dog. So therefore, the Brahmins were God's chosen people. And therefore, uh, you put an A in front of Brahmin, it becomes Abraham. And then you find out in the Old Testament that Abraham's name was not Abraham. It was Abram, A-B-R-A-M. Abram, not Abraham. And so the Bible says God chose Abram, uh, Abraman, uh, Abraman, or Abraman, and then calls his, and then changed his name to Abraham. And so Abraham had a wife, we're told in the scripture, her name was Sarah, Abraham and Sarah. Well, if you look into the Brahmin religion, they had a very powerful goddess that the Brahmins also, like the Catholics, worship Mary, the mother of God were the Brahmins, who were God's chosen people. They were the people of God. They had a, a woman also. They had a female goddess, and her name was Sarah Swasey. Sarah Swasey was the female goddess of the Brahmins, like Mary is the mother of Jesus. And so today we have Abraham and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah. There was no Abraham or Sarah. There's a Brahman, and the, and the goddess connected to a Brahmin religion is Saraswazi. So now you have a Brahman and Saraswazi, or Abraham and Sarah, and then, uh, you know, they were God's chosen people. Yeah, we see that. And, and then you find out that, uh, that the, all of Judaism is based on the Hin Hindu religion, and that the Christian religion is also based on the Hindu, also. Because we have in Christianity the Lord Jesus or the Lord Christ or Christ the Lord. Well, where, where are you getting the word Lord from? Where was the first time that's ever used? Well, that was used in India with Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna becomes Lord Christos in Greek. And then Christos in Greek is Christ in Latin, in, in, in Roman Empire. So therefore, we have Christ the Lord, which is uh, Lord Krishna, which is Lord Christos, which is the Lord Krishna in, in India. And so the whole idea of Lord Christ goes back to India. Well, the whole idea of Moses and Judaism, that goes back to India. As a matter of fact, everything you've got in your whole world goes back to India. India was a mighty, massive religious center many, many thousands of years ago. They gave birth to all of the strange religions we have today. But everybody wants to think that they are so holy and so special. And nobody wants to remember who gave birth to all of you as Hindus. The Hindu religion is the basis for all three major religions today. And especially is that true in Islam. Islam is crawling with Hinduism. Uh, if you go back into the Hindu religion and check out Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, and the moon god, Allah is the God in, of Islam. Allah is a name in the Arabic for the Hebrew God, Yahweh. Yahweh and Allah are the same God. It's just, it's just a difference between Hebrew and Arabic. So Allah and Yahweh is a moon God, the worshiper of the moon. 
But Judaism then also now takes on the worship of the planet Saturn. Saturn now, uh, you know, eventually now begins to take on the beginnings of what, uh, what we call Saturnian worship. So now the moon god is now being replaced by, uh, by the planet Saturn. And Saturn now becomes the uh, the most important, you know, symbol in Judaism. And so, the planet Saturn was was uh, Saturn was always associated with the color black, and so the 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 priests of Saturn in the ancient world wore black robes, and this is why today Catholic Church and Catholic wear black robes, and the Jewish rabbis wear black robes and black hats and black coats, uh, the, the men in black. And then, of course, you've got the uh, the uh, kids when they graduate from university, they wear a black robe. Uh, if you're a professor in, in a university, you wear a black robe. Black robes represented the planet Saturn, the god Saturn. And Saturn, in the old Phoenician language, we call it Hebrew. It's actually Phoenician language. We call Hebrew. But in the old Hebrew or Phoenician language, Saturn, the planet, was we'll spelled S H A B B A T H, Shabbat, S H A B B T H. And so Shabbat was the planet of Saturn. So if you're going to honor your God now that you've taken up worshiping Saturn, then you go to Sabbath. And so you go to Sabbath when? On Friday night at, at after six, you have Sabbath, which is the worship of the planet Saturn because Saturn is called Shabbat. And so there have been many books written about the difference between Shabbat and the Sabbath. So when when you hear Christians say, well, we, we keep holy the Sabbath day. Sabbath is the planet Saturn, period. So if you want to keep holy the Sabbath, that's Saturn. Saturn is Shabbat, and you worship him on the Sabbath. And that's why... Jews will have their their day begin six o'clock in the evening is Saturday, Saturn's day, and so the Jews go to L the Temp L on Saturn's day because they're worshiping the planet Saturn, Shabbat on the Sabbath. Get it? And so it, it all becomes very interesting and fascinating words and terms, but then it also becomes funny in places. When you see the queen having oil poured on her head and know what that really means. And then if you're going to be a, if you're going to be a preacher in, in, in Christianity, you got to go to a seminary. Saturn is represented by the cube, right? Yeah, the black cube. That's another symbol for the planet Saturn in the ancient Arabic world. Ancient Arabic world, uh, the symbol was a black cube, a black square. But in the, but in the Middle Ages, uh, Saturn uh, began to take on a new uh, symbol, early, early New Ages. Uh, a new symbol was attributed to Saturn, and that was a six-pointed star. And it was, and that's even in the Bible. In the, in the, in the Old Testament, God is talking to Israel, and he said, you have, you have dropped my worship and now are worshiping the planet Saturn. And, 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 and therefore, you have a, a holy star. You know, like that Jesus was, was the, uh, the the 12 apostles follow the holy star, which told where the Messiah was. And well, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it says, uh, God says to Israel, you have given up the worship of me, of, my, uh, of me as a God. You now are worshiping, uh, the word is China, I think it is C-H-I-U-N, which was a word in the in a Phoenician word for the planet Saturn. So even God is saying in the Old Testament, you are now worshipers of the planet Saturn. And when they, and the, and, and the symbol for Saturn, we've known since the Middle Ages and the, and the Christian, uh, in the Christian context, the symbol for Saturn was a six pointed star. And so what, they got that from the Babylonians because in Babylon, the, the priests used to draw a circle on the ground. A big circle, then they would step inside the circle and draw a triangle within the circle. And then they would turn, uh, like 180 degrees turn and draw another triangle over the, over the one. So now they got two triangles crisscrossing each other inside of a circle. 
And so that six-pointed star in Latin is a hex. A hexagram is six points. So the Star of David is a hexagram. It's a six-pointed star. Well, by dictionary definition, six points in Latin in the Roman Empire is the word hex. And so therefore today, the Jews all around the world are happy to show you they, are, they have the hex put on them. Because that's what it was. They, they, they would draw a six-pointed star inside a circle in Babylon, and then they would cast a spell on you an evil spell with demons. And so it was. that's what we get the word, putting the hex on you. Well, today, a six-pointed star is a hexagram. And so the star of David is a hex. And so the Jews will say, why are we always so mistreated and so abused and all these terrible things? Well, you're wearing a hex on you. You have the hex put on you, and you are proud of it. So if you're having a hex put on you by Saturn, because Saturn was always known in the Middle Ages by a hexagram. It's called the Star of Saturn. Look it up in a dictionary. So today the Jews are carrying around their neck a, a symbol for their god, the planet Saturn. Saturn was also referred to in the Middle Middle Ages as the, uh, as the uh, Lord of the Rings. And so today... We are still seeing Jews in Hollywood telling us about their god, Saturn, Lord of the Rings. And, of course, the planet Saturn is Lord of the Rings in heaven. So that's the Jews of Hollywood telling you about the Jewish god, Lord of the Rings, planet Saturn, Shabbat. You go, to where, you go and worship him on the Sabbath. And when is the Sabbath? It's on Saturn's day. Uh, and, you know, and then when you start looking at Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and the, the, and the, temp, and the Lost uh, Ark of the Temple, you come to find out there was no Ark. There was no Ark. The Jews never had an Ark. That's why today all these poor people running around spending money and time looking for the Lost, uh, the lost Ark of the, of the Temple, the Lost Ark of the Covenant. And everybody has found it. People finding the lost Ark of the Covenant, they're finding it in a, in a, in a trash can behind Sears. They're finding it in <laughs> Italy. They're finding it everywhere. Everybody is finding the lost Ark of the Covenant. And then I think to myself, if you only had a half a brain, you'd be dangerous. Because if you go to the Bible, go to the Bible and see what it says about the Ark of the Covenant. Well, if you go to the book of Revelation, which is the last book in the Bible, and go to the book of Revelation, you will see in the book of Revelation, it says that uh, that God uh, opened up his temple in heaven, it says. I'm paraphrasing. And that when God opened the temple in heaven, in the in the temple was the lost Ark of the Covenant. Because God wanted the, the Ark of the Covenant to be in his holy temple in the heavens. So the Bible says the lost Ark of the Covenant in the book of Revelation is in the heavens. It's in God's temple. And so that's why if you're looking for the lost Ark, everybody's found the lost Ark, but nobody showed us one. Everybody's talking about it, but nobody showed us uh, the lost Ark. Now, the important, important part is, is that Steven Spielberg, He's a lot of things, but stupid is not one of them. And Steven Spielberg in his movie, Indiana Jones and the Temple, uh, the, uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Well, first of all, when he is given, uh, Indiana Jones is given the, the commission by the U.S. government to go find the Lost Ark and do it quick before Hitler gets it. And so, and so if you saw the movie, uh, so Indiana Jones is the only one who could really find the Lost Ark. So where does he go first? Where does the first place he goes to look for the lost Ark of the Covenant? Indiana Jones goes to Tibet, in the mountains of the Himalayas to Tibet. Not to the Holy Land, because there's nothing holy in the Holy Land. The only thing holy today in the Holy Land are the stories that come out of it. They're full of holy. <laughs> so once you understand, Indiana Jones goes to <laughs> Tibet to find the lost Ark of the Covenant. And then once he gets what he's looking for, and he finds out that the Nazis are right there too, and they're looking for the lost ark, and they're in Tibet also. Why? Because they're not stupid either. 
they know that if you're going to find the lost ark, you better go to Tibet first. Why? Well, that's interesting. Why did Spielberg, uh, you know, say that Indiana Jones has to go to Tibet first? All right, so he finds what he's looking for, and now he knows how, how to find it. He goes there and finds that little crystal, and he's able to get it and keep it away from the Nazis. And so now his next next move for Indiana Jones to find the Lost Ark is he's now got to go to where the Lost Ark is. And so where does he go? He goes to Israel, to the Holy Ark of the Covenant? No. He goes to uh, Saudi Arabia? No. Where does he go? He goes to Egypt. And he finds the lost ark, be damned if he doesn't find it, in Egypt. And it's in an Egyptian temple. Like I said, Spielberg has a lot of things, but stupid is not one of them. He knows the whole idea of the Ark of the Covenant is an Egyptian story. There was no, there was no Jewish Ark. There was no Hebrew Ark. There was no Ark of the Israelites and all that. It's just a story. It has no foundation in fact whatsoever. However, there is a lot of material on the web and in, in, in the libraries on the Ark of the Contract. It's not called the Ark of the Covenant. It's referred to as the Ark of the Contract, and it was an Egyptian Ark. And it was buried in Egypt, and Indiana Jones finds it in Egypt. And so there was no Holy Ark of the Covenant for the Hebrews. There was no Holy Ark at all. There was no ancient Israel. There was no Solomon. There was no King Solomon or King David. Uh, during the Middle Ages, King David was, re was referred to in the writings as King Druid, D-R-U-I-D, not D-A-V-I-D, Druid, not David, King Druid. Then you find out the Druids, uh, that was a, that's a whole different story. So if you want to talk about King David, go back and do your homework. It wasn't King David, King Druid. And the Druids were a very powerful priesthood. They were a very, very powerful priesthood in Europe. Today, we refer to them as the ancient elders of Judaism. But the, in, uh, the but if you go into the library and look up the word Druid, look at the dress, look at how history uh, draws a picture of the Druids. They all wore the, 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 the garbs of a Jewish high priest. And they were referred to as the high priest of God. Well, today we have the Jewish high priest. Well, the high is because they were, you know, Moses was feeding them mushrooms, so they were all high. And so they get a high priest. Well, of course, a high priest. They're all a, they're all high off of the mushrooms. But the point <laughs> being is that when you see that the 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 the, the whole story of Judaism goes back to India, it goes back to Egypt and the lost Ark of the Covenant. There was no Ark of the Covenant. There's an Ark of the Contract. And then when you talk about the Ten Commandments, there was no Ten Commandments. And, and that, that's another story that's kind of funny. I'll throw this one in for you. This is a real laugh. The uh, We're told that Moses uh, went up into Mount Sinai, Sinai, and talked to the moon god, and God gave Moses a new set of laws. And and they were called the Ten Commandments. And so when God when Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, it supposedly ushers in a whole new time of, of religion for the for the Hebrew people. Today, when you see Jews at the Wailing Wall, we see that all the time in the news when the Jews are at the Wailing Wall. But first of all, the Jewish people believe that that is the temples. That's a wall. From temple from Solomon's temple, and so they are asking for the temple of Solomon. They're asking God to bring back Solomon's temple, the great temple of the Jewish people, which would dominate the whole world. The wealthiest, most powerful people in the world would now run the whole world. There would be Jews that would run the entire world, and they they were worshippers of of Yahweh, the Moon God, and that they are at the temple wall. Well, in point of fact. Uh, what the what the poor Jewish people have not been told is that that wall that we call the Wailing Wall today does not have anything whatsoever to do with Judaism, period. That is a Roman wall that was built by the Romans under Caesar. 
It's a Roman wall, and it's called Fort Antonia. Go to the dictionary and look up the word Fort Antony with an I, Antonia. And it will show you that the Roman fort that the Romans built was called Fort Antonia during the Crusades, and that today uh, it is referred to as the Wailing Wall of Judaism. But that wall has nothing to do with Jews at all. It's a Roman fort. And so the man who led the crusade when the Pope, uh, Pope Innocent, what a hell of a name for a Pope, Pope Innocent uh, was going to send all the troops to the Middle East uh, to chase the Arabs out of the uh, out of Jerusalem and give it back to the Christians. Well, when the Pope sent the Knights Templars, the Masonic Order of Knights Templars, they were the they were the generals and they were the big shots who were going to conduct the war. And so when they got into uh, and so what's interesting is the dictionary, the encyclopedias will tell you that the man that the Pope picked to lead the troops, he he picked one man to lead the whole crusade. Uh, and that was a French Jew, a Jewish guy in France. His name was Rashis. Rashis was a Jewish uh, teacher. He was very well respected and known as a master teacher of Judaism in France. But he was also a master at, at military. And so the Pope picked him, Rashis, uh, to, to lead the, uh, the, the, the crusaders. And so when the Rashis led the Crusades and, and went into Jerusalem and kicked the Islamic uh, loons, uh, the Islamic loonies out of Jerusalem and then proclaimed that Jerusalem now is under the domination of the Holy Father and, 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 and now the Holy Father is now the God over all Jerusalem, which he is today. Uh, but, but what was interesting, and this is in the encyclopedia, uh, that, that Rashis, the general, his, his, the name he took officially before he left for the Crusades, his official title was, uh, was not Rashis. That's just his name. He took the title of, of, uh, Solomon Bar Isaac. And he was re referred to by the military as the, uh, as the general Solomon Bar Isaac. Which was a, which was a French Jew named Rashid. And so once he was able to uh, kick the Islamic world out of Jerusalem and turn it back over to the Holy Father, and uh, nothing holy about him but the Holy Father, then he asked, uh, uh, Rashid asked the Pope for a favor. And basically he said, basically, look at, I've done what you wanted. You wanted the Islams out, they're out. I've taken over Jerusalem for you, but now I want something. And so the Pope says, all right, so what, what are I going to give you? What, what, are, what do you want? He said, I want that, uh, that uh, uh, Dome of the Rock. I want that as my headquarters. I want that whole section, section uh, of Jerusalem uh, under the Dome of the Rock and all that area around it. I want that for my castle. I want the Islamic world to know that's mine. I own it. I live here. And so and so the Pope did. He gave him that whole area to let him live there, and it's his home. And so it became known as Solomon's Temple. Not Solomon, King Solomon. No, Solomon bar Isaac, Rashid, the German, the, the, the French general that was used in, in, in the, in the uh, Crusades. So... It has nothing to do with King Solomon. There was no Solomon. It never existed. But there is a Solomon bar Isaac, the, the French general. And so today you find the Jews all at the Solomon's temple at the wall, wailing at the wall, just like they're wailing on the wall street. But now they're wailing at the wall. And they think it's Solomon's temple. No, it's Solomon bar Isaac. Go back and wake up and get a life and, and find out where all of this stuff really comes from. This is mind-boggling, Jordan. I'm listening and I'm learning here, too. And um, Because it, it says that everything that everybody's been told and taught is a complete hoax. Yeah, well, wait, you haven't heard the good part. I'm coming to the good part. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so, yeah, and so when you see today, you will see on television, on the news all the time, 
the the Jews at the Wailing Wall, and they're all in black. They all got black hats and black coats and black everything because Saturn color is black. So they're worshiping Saturn, but they're at the Wailing Wall of King Solomon. No, it's actually Solomon Bar Isaac, a, a French general. And so they're all there, and then when they're praying, you'll notice that when the Jews are praying at the Wailing Wall, they're weaving back and forth. They're yeah. weaving in a rhythmic, uh, rhythmic uh, back and forth. They're weaving as they're praying. Do you know why they're doing that? They're having sex with God. That's called having sex with the Shekinah. So you are having sex with the Shekinah, and so that's why you're weaving back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So that's where it all comes from. The Jews are having sex with Shekinah, not he, Shekinah. And the Shekinah is supposedly the feminine principle of God, because see, God made man in his own image, male and female, he made him, which is implied in Hebrew that God is a hermaphrodite. He's both male and female. And so today, if you're going to worship God and you're a man, you would be bobbing back and forth, having sex with the female principle of God, with the Shekinah. Shekinah is the female principle of God. So uh, we're talking about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, just money and silly not, and nonsense and religion. And uh, I'm just amazed at how how much of this story of religion is just not known around the world. And people are, are putting their lives on the line and dying to to protect the, the dome of the rock. And that's a, there's, a, there's a joke for you, too. Why they call that dome the dome of the rock? It's because the Islamic world believes that their God came in a meteorite. He, he, he came down. And no, serious. This is true. They believe that God sent down a meteorite. <laughs> that had all the important rules and regulations that Allah, the moon god, uh, wanted their, his religion to follow. And so he put it all on a, on a meteorite and threw it down to earth. And when it came down to earth, it landed in what, a place called Mecca. And so they built a square, uh, they, you know, they, they built a square around that to honor Saturn. But, uh, but the dome of the rock, the rock actually is the is the communication between Allah and the Islamic world. Allah sent a meteorite, and it's a round meteorite, and it's called the Dome of the Rock. So you could say that the Islamic world worships a rock. They have a pet rock, and it's called the <laughs> Dome of the Rock. And so, and so I think, yeah, it's true. Rock, you got rocks in your head is the problem. And it, it's all a dome of the rock, the dome of the, uh, the meteor. All are sent down a meteor, and, and it's got all the important stuff on the meteor. That somebody went in there with a with a bottle of whiskey and came out and said he read it, and here's what God said on the meteorite. And so today it's called the dome of the rock. And uh, I, I'm just a, you know, a, where do you start with all this stuff? It's fascinating and funny and interesting. If you really hear the real story and where this stuff really comes from. So after looking at all this nonsense and, and chatter, uh, you then begin to see Israel. Well, first of all, go back to, go back to Egypt. And then there was a time in ancient Egypt when the worship in, in Egypt was the worship of a woman. Her name was Isis. Isis was a female principle of theology and religion. Because the ancient peoples believed that the mother, the female in the family, holds the key to all the spirituality of the family. The man is out there, you know, doing what he's doing, wars and violence and, and, you know, protection of the family, but he's the man. But the spiritual part of the family, the mother takes care of. The mother teaches the children all of the principles of life. So the mother was the great teacher. So in, 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 in Egypt, Isis was the great feminine principle of theology and religion. Now, when the people we call today, well, we're told in the Bible that the Jews were in, in uh, they were, they were in Egypt and Moses said, let my people go. Yeah, well, and they were not called Jews. They were called Hyksos people. And this is in the history books. So you go look at the Hyksos people and they were not Hebrews at all. 
they were a nomadic tribe called the Hyksos. And the word Hebrew was given to them by the ancient peoples of Egypt because Hebrew uh, word, uh, the word Hebrew means it's a derogatory term. It's like the N word for the black man. It's a derogatory term to call a Jew a Hebrew because the word Hebrew means one who crossed over illegally. Okay. That's what it means, one who crossed over illegally. Like today, we they used to have a term in Mexico, wetback, meaning somebody who was illegally here. Well, in, 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 in ancient Egypt, the Hyksos people were called Iberus or Iberus or Hebrews, or today we call them Hebrews. Hebrews simply meant the ones who crossed over into Egypt illegally. They were the illegals. And so... When when you understand that they crossed over into Egypt illegally, and then there was a then uh, and at that time when they were in Egypt, the Hyksos people, the worship around Egypt was called was for the Isis, the, the feminine principle of religion. Then later on, for uh, 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 Pharaoh Akhenaten came along. Pharaoh Akhenaten comes along, and he decides we've had enough of this uh, this nonsense of the feminine religion because we've all become so feminine we don't know how to fight anymore we don't know how to do anything because we're all feminine so from here on out we're going to have a man's religion and from this time on it's going to be our father in heaven not our mother and so you know and if you don't like that you just open your mouth and let me know about it <laughs> yeah and so he could do that because he was pharaoh and so he changed the worship from Isis to the sun god Amun Re, and and today we we still understand today that the sun god in Egypt was called Amun A M E N hyphen R A. Ray was the sun, and so that's why we put a Y on it becomes Sun Ray. No Sun Ra R A. The, the the worship of the of the sun god was called Amun Re, and so uh, the Egypt said, the Pharaoh said, nobody can see God. Ain't nobody ever seen God and they ain't going to see him. But you can see his son. And so if you've seen his son, you've seen the father. Because he looks just like, uh, he looks just like his father. And so today, that's what we, you know, if you have a, a male offspring, we call him your son. And people say, he looks just like you. Well, of course he looks like me. He came from me. He looked like me. And so, therefore, he was God's son, the light of the world. Of course, the sun, S-U-N, is the light of the world. And so, Pharaoh knocked and said, we've got a new God. His name's going to be Amun Ray. And he's not God, but he is God's son, S-U-N. He's the son of God. And so, when you pray to him, you're praying to God, but you, you, you can't talk to God. So, you're praying to God through his son. And so, when you end, end your prayer, you say, Amen. Because his name is Amen Right or Amen Ra. And so you say Amen. Well, we're still doing that. We're still <laughs> worshiping the Son today. We're called Jesus, God's Son, the light of the world. Of course, the Son is the light of the world. But what's interesting is now the worship of the, the, the worship in Egypt was now slowly but surely changing to the worship of a male God, God the Father. And his name was Ra. Amun Re, Amun Ra. Then after the Hebrews, or what we call the Hyksos people, left out of Egypt, there was a war, and the Egyptians fought against the, uh, the Hyksos people and chased them out of the country. There was a big problem with, the, uh, with uh, immigration, but the Egyptians just chased them out, period. You either get out or you're dead. And so they ran out of Egypt. They were chased out of Egypt. And Moses didn't go into Pharaoh and say, let my people go. No, the Hyksos people, they ran. And But they, you know, it's the typical, when, when they get to a new place, they tell everybody, yeah, well, we were in Egypt. We had enough of their bullshit. And we had enough of them. And, <laughs> and uh, we, we just said, no more. We're leaving. Let my people go. Well, if you actually remember what happened, no, you got kicked out. You were chased out. And so when the he, when the Hicks, those people left out of Egypt, they didn't have Moses saying, let my people go. They were just running for their lives. So when they ran, where did they run to? They ran northward. Well, what's just north of Egypt? And if it isn't uh, Israel and, and Cana, the land of Cana. 
And so when they came into the land of Cana, they found they, they confronted a people called uh, Phoenicians. They were called the Philistines. And so uh, uh, what we call today the the Arab population around uh, around Israel are called uh, the Palestinians. Okay, well, in Palestine back then. Uh, they had a god. There, uh, they already had a god themselves. The Palestinians did, and it wasn't Isis or Amun Ray. It was called El E L, and the Palestinians today still worship El, but El was the planet Saturn, and so today we have the combining of the uh, of the worship of Isis. The worship of Amun Ra and the worship of El. It becomes I S R A E L. Isis, Ra, El, or Israel. God's chosen people. Now, I think you better go back and do some homework where that word Israel came from. Isis, Ra, and El. It's like that story about King Solomon. No, it's not Solomon, it's Saul, S O L, for the son. And O M Om in Hindu for the sun, and the city of the sun called Heliopolis by the ancient Egyptians called Heliopolis on O N, and that's why you flip a light switch on because the on was the city of the light, and so therefore today we have Sol Om Sol Om and On the name of the sun and the three esoteric languages. There was no King Solomon. Just a story. So what I'm saying, it's all a wonderful world of fascinating, fun, interesting, great, uh, fascinating knowledge about religion that nobody wants to talk about in public at all, period. Why? Because they're all going to find out one day it's going to happen when one day the whole world is going to have to come face to face with the fact that we have been bullshitting each other for years and thousands of years. And that's why one military guy said, and I thought was very interesting, he said, propaganda does not fool you. Propaganda helps you to fool yourself. It doesn't fool you. You're just so stupid you bought into it. You know? And so that's why today the whole world has bought into Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and all the holiness of holy, and come to find out there's nothing holy in it at all. It's full of holes. The holes are in the stories they tell you. None of it ever happened. There was no old, there was no ancient Israel, there was no Jesus, there was no prophets, there was no King David. There was no King Solomon. There was no ancient Israel. None of this ever happened. It's just a story. And today, now, finally, is beginning to appear that that is actually the case. It's all falling apart. It's wars and violence and sex and drugs and Catholic Church selling children and buying dope and narcotics and the mafia going to church every day and and the Godfather 1, 2, and 3 all takes place in the Vatican. And we come to find out, no, the whole entire dirty world is religion, government, and money. It's just business, like the mob says. There is nothing holy in the Middle East, period. Now, Jordan, the Saturn worship, what does Saturn represent to them? I, mean, I know it's a god, but when did they go from moon worship to Saturn worship, and what does... What does Saturn worship mean? Well, Saturn was referred to as the inhibitor, the one who holds you back and teaches you a lesson. He was he was a very stern, understood. Now, all the ancient peoples in the Middle East understood Saturn was a, in, the inhibitor, one who could hold you back and teach you a lesson so that today, we refer to certain uh, certain facets of our world as Saturnian. Uh, the the mafia is Saturnian. The courts, the court and judges are Saturnian. The police department is Saturnian. You you look these words up in the in the uh, in the uh, etymology dictionaries of the occult world, and they're all called Saturnian. Uh, so the police department is Saturnian, the military is Saturnian. Why? Because they have the arm. They're armed, and they they can hold you back and teach you a lesson. 
You think you're going to do something when the army pulls in, you got another thing coming. And so anything that can hold you back and restrict you and teach you a lesson uh, is referred to as Saturnian or from Saturn. This is why today when the Jews uh, are, are worshiping their god Saturn on Saturn's day, and Saturn being Shabbat, and, and so the worship of Shabbat is called the Sabbath, and so today on the Sabbath, the Jews will do nothing. They don't, they don't touch anything. <laughs> they're not going to pick up anything. They're not going to do anything. Why? Because the Jews said that Saturn was the inhibitor. He inhibits you and teaches you a lesson and tells you no and will teach you a lesson. And so the, the Jews during the Middle Ages said, well, since Saturn is the inhibitor and he's going to hold us back, then why don't we, when we're worshiping him on Saturn's day, why don't we just do zero nothing? Now he doesn't have to hold us back and we ain't doing nothing anyway. So he's not going to do nothing, go nowhere, and uh, do nothing. So he don't have to hold us back anymore. So we just ain't going to do nothing, period. So that's why the Jews won't do anything on the Sabbath, because Saturn was the inhibitor. But Saturn was also the god of the dark world, the black robe. And that's why today when you go to court, the judges wear a black robe. So does Darth Vader and, and, and Dracula wear a black robe. Kronos, time also, right? Yeah, of course, of course. It gives us that word calendar. Kronos gives us that word calendar because Saturn was the inhibitor. He holds you back. And not, not for, not for a couple of minutes. He holds you back. He maybe holds Mexico back for a thousand years. It's a Saturnian country. Uh, he holds, uh, he holds a, uh, you know, a particular religion back 3,000 years because it's a Saturnian religion. So Saturn was referred to the, as the inhibitor, the one who holds you back and teaches you a lesson. When you look around, Saturn worship is all around us. You know, all cubes. Of, everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah. You know, in Mecca, they walk around the cube, right? Precisely. When they're walking around the, the cube, that's, that's called circumcumulate. I think that's the word. It, it means to walk around seven times around a god. You walk around the god seven times. We're told that the Jews were, they went around Jericho. They marched around Jericho seven times and the wall tumbling down. And then we found on National Geographic and in Israel, they said uh, there was a little problem with that story of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down because the problem was there were no walls. Uh, Jericho never had any wall. They didn't have no wall. So how could the walls come tumbling down? Well, it's very simple. They didn't have any walls to begin with. And so when the Jews went around Jericho, it's just like the Arabs going around Mecca. It's a so it's a word, and I, I can't pronounce it correctly, but it means to try, to roam around your God seven times. And then you ask for something. You go around him seven times, and then you can get something from him. And so today we see the, the Arabs in the Middle East are worshiping uh, Allah. Today the Jews are worshiping the planet Saturn. Uh, Hollywood, <laughs> Hollywood, Hollywood's out there spreading all the stories. Uh, what's interesting, and probably a lot of people have heard this, but there might be some of the audience who haven't, so I'll say it again. Um, before the Roman Empire existed in Europe, there was already a big, large civilization of people living in Europe before the Roman Empire, and and that and that those people lived in the north east, west, and southern uh, Europe. And there was a large group of humans living in Europe, in the north, east, and western, southern Europe. So that's where we get the word news, from north, east, west, and south, N-E-W-S. So anything that happens in the north, east, west, or south is news, <laughs> N-E-W-S. But, uh, but the point being is that there was already a large uh, contingent of people living in Europe before Rome. And so, but those people are referred to as the Celtic or Celtic people, the Celts or the Celts. And so the Celtic or Celtic people that were already living in, in, in Europe, they were the most important group of people in Europe. They were the lawyers, the doctors, the experts, the religious leaders, the governmental leader, leaders, the the Celtic or Celtic people 
where the, they ran Europe, period, until the coming of the empire, the Roman Empire. And so the Celtic people, one of the most important symbols among the Celt peoples, uh, the people of Europe, was a magic wand. Today we have Merlin the Magician with his magic wand. You have Mickey Mouse with his magic wand. You also have orchestra leaders and orchestra conductors who are leading the music with their magic wands, right? Right. All right. So magic wands, we now know from the history, magic wands were made out of the wood of a holly tree. It's made out of Hollywood. Get it? Yep. Yep. And so today, America is, is, is working its magic on the world from Hollywood. No, the wood of a holly tree, you make magic wands out of. And so today, uh, what's going on on the earth today is that Hollywood is actually the center for a profound, dark presence in the world that we would call demonism, a devil worship, demonism. It's in, it's in science, it's in the science of music, pictures, colors. Hollywood is crabbing, uh, just filled with all kinds of dark, child sacrifice, sexual sacrifice, all kinds of incredible darkness that gives it the power it has in the world. Because like the, the, the scripture said, the whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. We're told that Satan is the god of this world. Well, boy, you can bet your ass on that. <laughs> because the whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. Why? Because Hollywood runs this world. Hollywood uh, puts out the stuff and the whole world just lips it and lacks it up. They can't wait to see the next movie and learn what the Hollywood wants you to know. And so it's a magical system that's being worked on the people of this world. And they have no idea in the world that this stuff is legitimately real. And there's a dark magic to it that requires human sacrifice, child sacrifice, sexual rituals, death. It requires all kinds of dark stuff that would scare the hell out of you if you even knew what was going on. But it's required by the dark forces of Hollywood. It's required of the dark side of this world. The prince of darkness, the one we talk about, devil. Uh, the word devil simply is the word evil with a D in front of it. So D in front of evil becomes devil. And, and God comes from the same root as the word good. So you take an O out of good, becomes God. And God is good, and the devil is evil. No, it's just words. But there's something else going on bigger and far, far more frightening than you have any imagination for. And like this, one astronomer said, he said that the, that the universe is not only stranger than you imagine, it's stranger than you can imagine. So I'm saying Hollywood in America and the world we live in is not only far, far more wicked and evil than you even begin to suspect. You haven't got the faintest idea in the world how dark and evil the world you live in really is. But the guys at the top who are, you know, are murdering children and, and, and raping, raping and killing and all the bull crap that they do on, on the earth with wars and violence and selling drugs. They're drugging the whole planet. These people are not human. The whole world is in the hands of a dark, sinister force. I started talking about this back in 1959 and 60 and 61. I was giving lectures about the secret societies that are behind world religions and world government and banking and insurance companies and how the world really works, not how you thought it worked. So, you know, I've just been doing this for many years until I thought I was talking to myself most of the time. But it seems as though now, finally, uh, Hollywood is beginning to awaken to the fact that uh, they, they need to make money off of this. And so now they're making movies like Godfather 3 and Godfather and, and, and uh, Goodfellows and, uh, and, and National, National Treasure, National Treasure 1 and 2. Now they're starting to talk about the secret societies and the criminal organizations and Stanley Kubrick comes out with his eyes wide shut. If that doesn't scare you, nothing won't. Yeah. All I'm saying is that the world is slowly but surely 
arriving at a point where it's beginning to look like nothing in this world is what you thought it was. And all of it is far, far more serious and evil and, de and degenerate than what you even suspected. And so now people are waking up to the realization of this is the world you live in. You need to wake up and find out, you know, the, we are in serious trouble. The whole human race is in serious trouble because the people who gave you your, your religions, who gave you your governments, who gave you your philosophies are the same people that gave you your, your banks and your governmental systems and your state houses. All of this is being orchestrated by a very powerful force in the world that we don't know anything about, but it is spiritual and it's very dark and it's leading the whole human race somewhere. We're all feeling it now. But most people have no idea in the world where it's coming from or where it's taking us. People are becoming more aware now of the fact that things are very different than what they have been taught and told. I mean, do you see it as a there's some kind of positive transformation taking place or you just see it as no, you're waking up to the fact that this place is just flat out evil? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and people will tell me, and I've had so many people say to me, well, you know, there is there is there 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 is looks like it's a, a light at the end of the tunnel. And I said, yes, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. It's a train coming. <laughs> yeah. So wake up. There's a train coming. That's the light at the end of the tunnel. And so we say, well, you know, people are waking up today. And I said, that's what people do when they're in prison. Now, all the guys up at San Quentin, every morning they wake up. But they're not going anywhere. They can't yeah. do anything. So just because the people are waking up, they have no power to do anything. Why? Because knowledge is power. Knowledge alone is power. And the more you know, the more you begin to see how powerful knowledge really is. That's why you have people in this world that will pay millions of dollars to you if you got something that they really want to know. If you got something that's really important to them, they will pay you money for it. So knowledge is power. And so the more you understand about the world you live in, the more how it works and who the people are who are running this world and how it all works, now you could do something about it. If you were given a chance, at least now you understand the problem. But, uh, but too many people don't, don't get it. They don't know. You don't, you can't do anything about the world you live in because you don't understand anything about it. And I've said this to you before and I'll say it again. If you owned, if you owned a, a, a two-story building, suppose you own a two-story commercial building and you want to, uh, you want to open up a museum or a printing factory or something on the second floor and you're going to have automobiles stored up there and you're going to have printing presses and all kinds of really heavy equipment. The smart thing to do is go downstairs with the building inspector first. And get up, get up on a ladder with the building inspector, remove the ceiling tiles from the, from the first floor and look at the foundation of that floor to see if it's going to hold that kind of weight before you go piling on printing presses, et cetera. And so what you're doing is you're standing under the foundation to see if that foundation is going to hold that kind of weight. So when you're standing under, now you got understanding because you're standing under. So if you want to understand something, you go under it. Don't look at the subject. Go go do some real homework. Go back and look at it for five years, day in and day out. And then finally you will come to the point where you understand something. You know, you're not just hearing it just off the top of the back of your head. You've heard it. And you think you understand, you don't understand nothing. You have no idea in the world what's going on in this world, on this earth. And so when you hear the president said this and the president said that, and, and China's going to do this and North Korea is going to do that, you have no idea in the world. This is one world. This is not 186 different nations. This is one world. And nobody on this earth does anything unless it passes the guys who run this planet. The people who run this planet will decide what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. 
And so, you know, the guys who run this planet are not afraid of North Korea or China or Russia or anybody else. It's just business. And so when you find out what these people are like, if you think the mafia is bad to deal with, where do you deal with uh, uh, you know, where the president of the United States is? You know, you, you can get, be killed there real quick. They'll cut your throat and your head off instantly because this is real power. We're talking about money and political power and the balance of power in the world is in the hands of the men who can take it, who can deal with it. So I, I know, I'm just telling you, the, the world we live in is a very frightening place. And like Albert Einstein said, the world is a very, very uh, powerful and, 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 uh, and an evil place. Not because bad people do bad things, but because the good people can't do nothing. They don't do anything. And so that's what's going on. The world of mankind is slowly but surely awakening to the fact that their religions are not working anymore that there was no Moses, there was no Abraham, there was no uh, uh, King David or King Solomon. None of these stories were true. It's all based on on the ancient uh, mythologies, etc. And uh, and and also there's there's some very good uh, books being written now out of France and out of uh, out of the Middle East, where some of the uh, leading theolo- uh, theoreticians in the Islamic world are saying that there was no uh, Muhammad. Muhammad never lived. There was no such a man as Muhammad. And then when you start looking at the uh, the Quran and find out where they're basing the Quran on, and it's being based on, on far earlier uh, transcripts and writings coming out of India and coming out of ancient Greeks, the ancient Greek. Then you begin to see the, 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 the mess that the human race is in. There is no possible way we're going to change anything because it's too big. It's too far gone. The people are too ignorant, too ill-informed, too divided. And so, unfortunately, you know, we can sit and talk all day. I, what I do is I talk just to help those people who know there's something really wrong and they want to know where all of this nonsense has come from. That's what I do. I just try and educate people to wake up, do some homework on your own, and just understand nothing is what you think it is, period. Not your government, not your bank. (laughs) I could go into law and why do you have, you know, why do you have a police department today? You didn't have a police back in the Wild West days when John Wayne was riding around with the cowboys. You didn't have police. Right. Yeah, you had the sheriff and 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 the marshal. But that was just one man. He just represented the government. Uh, and so you have to wait three or four months till the judge uh, or the, the, the traveling circuit court judge would come around. And so they just put you in jail till the judge shows up because they don't have any authority. But today we have police. Why? That's a whole story. Uh, why do you have the police department today when you didn't have them before? Well, that that's a very interesting subject. And we can talk about that next time. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about next time. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll definitely catch up again, Jordan. This has been very fascinating. A lot of information here that I have to kind of process through myself. So let me ask this then. The, the people who are pulling the strings, the puppet masters or the controllers, yeah. is it the Jesuits? I think so. That's my hunch. My gut feeling is that the ultimate real authority at the top of what we call Illuminati are is actually the Jesuits and or a secret society within the Jesuits, which is the real masters of the Jesuits, because the the Jesuits are the masters uh, around the world behind the scenes of wars, revolutions, violence, Vietnam wars, the the uh, Middle Eastern wars, everywhere you go, everywhere you look, all the dark, deep dark political stuff of assassinations and child sacrifice and all that, that's all Jesuit, comes out of the Roman Catholic Church. Rome ruled the world. 2,300 years ago, 2,500 years ago, Rome dominated Europe, and Europe dominated the world. So all over the world, the earth was dominated by Europe, and who dominates Europe but the Vatican? So today, America is nothing more than a Jesuit Catholic institution. 
It's called the United States of America, but it has nothing to do with America. It has to do with the Roman Empire. We are nothing more than a Jesuit Catholic organization called the United States of America. And so Caesar, uh, if you go back and read the history books about the rule of Rome, the seat of power in Rome, where Caesar ruled the empire from, was called Capitol Hill. And the, and the reference book said that every morning Caesar would, quote, go up on the hill. So Caesar was up on the hill. Well, we say the same thing today. The president is up on the hill. Right, Capitol Hill. Right. Capitol Hill. Well, what was the name of the hill that Caesar ruled from? Capitoline. Capitoline Hill. So Caesar ruled Rome from Capitol Hill. And how did he rule Rome? He ruled it through the Senate. Well, that's what we have up on the hill is the Senate. <laughs> and so we are the modern-day Roman Empire. And like Rome, like ancient Rome, fell apart because it started off as a republic with a constitution, like America. We started off with a republic with a constitution. Then later on, uh, with the with the coming of the of the murderers and all the corruption uh, came in and changed the whole Roman Empire from a republic to a democracy. And so today, that's what we talk about, you know, to the democracy, you know, salute the flag and to the democracy uh, for which it stands. This is no, this is no democracy. This was founded as a republic, not a democracy. Right. A democracy is 35 guys hanging one. You get 65 different guys and they all want to hang one guy because of his color or his religion or whatever. So that's a democracy. Demos, it means a, a mob. This is why when the mob is in the street burning cars and busting windows and turning trucks over, we call it mob rule. Well, what is mob in Greek? It's demos. So therefore, when they're out in the street busting windows, it's called a demonstration. Demonstration. It's a, it's a mob rule. And so a mob rule is called demosocracy, a democracy. A democracy is mob rule. We don't give a damn about your laws. We don't care what's written on your law books and all that BS. We are in power. We got in power. We are in power, Jackson. And I am God, period. If you don't think so, you mess with me. I am the president, and I'll throw you in the prison. We'll get the Federal Reserve to do an audit on your income tax, and you're going away for 30 years because there is no law. Zero law. There is no law. In America today, there is no law. And people don't realize that. I do because I've been there. I know. Yeah. There is no law. There is only what the people in power today say it is. And so when you get stopped by a cop on the street, uh, he doesn't know the law, but he doesn't need to know the law. Whatever he says it is, that's what it is. Right. You got a problem with that? They give him some back talk. And so whatever the people who are in power say the law says, that's what it says. And then if you go to another city and you get stopped by a sheriff, and whatever he says, that's what the law is. You ask him, where is that a book? He don't know anything about a book. The hell with your book. I'm, I'm the sheriff here, and I said this is this and that, and that's it. That's the law. You don't think so? Give me some mouth and I'll have you put under arrest right now, put into jail and know your, your, your family's not going to hear from you for six weeks. So today there is no law, written law. Today there is only what the people in power say the law says. And if you understand that, that's how dangerous it is now. So you've got to be out of your mind to go out into the world today and act like you are free. You know, like Dick Gregory said, you know, you know this is a land of free and a home of the brave. You ain't free or brave. You better go back and do some homework and find out you have police now. You don't have a sheriff and, a, uh, and the old way that the, uh, the republic used to be run. It's a whole new game today. And the one thing you need to know is you are not free. So, period. If you, you anything you're going to do in this country, you better get a permit, and you better get the license and get the permit paid, and call the lawyer so he can make sure it's going to be all right with the government. You just don't go out and do anything in this country without getting a lawyer and 
paying a fine or a fee and getting a ticket or a license or something. You don't just go out and do anything you want to do. You ain't free. You ain't been free for a long time, son, and you ain't free now. And you don't think so? Wait till the cops want to break in your door and bust your door in and, and take you as a hostage and take you to prison and you find out you ain't free. And, and no matter, no matter what the attorneys say, uh, you'll still go into prison. You, you can cry all you want and say all the things you want to about the law. But at the end of the day, whatever the judge says the law is, that's what it is. Period. End of sentence. What about things like, uh, Bolshevism, communism, socialism? Is that all, are these all ideologies that were created by the Jesuits? In, yeah, in your yeah absolutely. Yes. No doubt about that. We know that Jesuits created communism. The Soviet communist uh, movement in the world was Jesuit movement. We know that Adolf Hitler was, was, uh, we know even in the New York Times, they had a, they had a big article about the man who wrote Mein Kampf. And the, and Mein Kampf, we say that Adolf Hitler wrote Mein Kampf. No, he did not. There's a guy named Father Stimple, S-T-E-M-P-L-E, Father Stimple. Well, the Stimple was a Jesuit theologian who wrote Mein Kampf and then put Adolf Hitler's name on it. And so when people today say, well, you know, Adolf Hitler wrote Mein Kampf, I say, no, he did not. Karl Marx did not write the Communist Manifesto. It had nothing to do with it. Uh, the people who wrote the Communist Manifesto was a small group of people in England that were connected to a secret society in Europe. And they, they, there was a secret group in England who wrote the book, the Communist Manifesto. But they, and they were referred to as the, uh, what was their name? The, um, I'll think of it in a minute. So, but, but it was a, it was a small group of men in England and they wrote the Communist Manifesto, uh, and they were financed by the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, and the, the J.P. Morgans and the Morgan Guarantee, uh, they, all the big shots in Europe with the big money, uh, they wanted the communism. They wanted communism uh, to uh, in, in Europe. The big guys with the, at the top of the world, they wanted communism. So they, they hired, uh, oh, the name of the group was called the League of Just Men, J-U-S-T. The League of Just Men, and they made a movie. They made a movie of, uh, with Sean Connery, the meeting with the remarkable men or something like right, that. Right, right, right. Yeah, and then you see how, yeah, that movie was based on the founders of world communism in, in England. And so the British came up with the idea, the British banking families came up with the idea of communism. So they financed communism, and Karl Marx was falsely proclaimed as the author of communism. Karl Marx didn't write anything. It's just like uh, it's just like evolution. Uh, Charles Darwin wrote zero zero nothing period about evolution. All of this stuff in the evolution was written by a, a guy named, uh, his last name was Wallace. Wallace did, wrote a series of books about evolution of, of life on the earth, how animals evolve from one kind of an animal to another. And and uh, Charles Darwin and Wallace both worked for the, the British East India Company. The British East India Company, operating in India for the Queen, was doing all kinds of experiments on, on people to see how they could control humans, how they could control them. They were using drugs, they were using terror, they were using all kinds of, of, of stuff going on that the British were concocting to control the world, and they went into India, and they started a company called the British East India Company. And out of the British East India Company came the International World Drug Trade, all the drugs that were being moved all around the world uh, for Japan and in China, the opium dens, all of that was orchestrated by the British East India Company. And two or three of the most important people at the British East India Company was Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin worked for the British East India Company in the mind control department, and that was what his, his job was to figure out how to control the human family, and that was one of his jobs. And there was another guy there named uh, Wallace, 
and Wallace was actually a scientist who was looking at the, uh, the, the, the story of evolution as a political tool, how to use evolution politically. Wallace was going around the world doing research on how animals can can uh, mutate and how you know all life on the earth is evolving. And Charles Darwin had zero nothing to do with the whole subject. That wasn't his subject at all. But his family were was some of the big investors in the British East India Company, and so Charles Darwin's money and his family's money was financing this Wallace to do his part of the research for the British East India Company. So it all becomes very interesting when you find out Charles Darwin did not write anything about evolution, period. Wallace did. There's a book that explains it in detail. The book is called A Delicate Arrangement. You write it down and get the book called A Delicate Arrangement. The story of the lie of Charles Darwin and and, uh, and Wallace and the whole story behind evolution. Uh, Charles Darwin had nothing whatsoever to do with it, and Adolf Hitler had nothing to do with uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, Mein Kampf that was a Jesuit priest, and it actually said in the new in the New York Times, and it's in the it's on the web too if you look for it. Father Stemple wrote Mein Kampf, and he was a Jesuit theologian. He wrote that for the Nazi Party. God knows, I, I, we could go down the line and name off all the famous people who wrote famous things and famous books that caused certain revolutions, etc. And then you find out, no, they never wrote nothing. The whole thing is just a cock and bull story dreamt up in New York at the, at the newspapers, and they put these cock and bull stories out. And Karl Marx and V.I. Lenin and Trotsky and all of these top communists, they all worked in New York. And they were sent over to Russia to overthrow the czar's government. And they, and they went over there with J.P. Morgan's money out of Georgia and Philadelphia. Morgan Guarantee Trust. Morgan Guarantee Trust is a big banking outfit in Philadelphia. And, of course, the, the, the Rockefeller Banks in New York and Citicorp Bank out of Chicago. All of these big international bankers in America gave the money. To, uh, to the, what we call the WRM, the World Revolutionary Movement, who financed Adolf Hitler. They financed Hitler's uh, war in, in the Europe. They financed the founding of the Soviet Union and the United States government. <laughs> you may not know this, but there was an article in Argosy magazine back in 19, I don't know, 50. A uh, fascinating uh, magazine called Argosy. They all had incredible, wonderful stuff in there, all kinds of secret stuff. And and they they had a whole article about how the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve during the early uh, late fifties and early forties, uh, I mean early forties and late fifties was the founding of the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union was coming into being that the communists had taken over Russia, the communists ran out of money. They always started off with nothing and ended up with nothing. The communists never have any money because they don't work. I mean, I like what Jackie Mason said about communism. He said, uh, uh, communism will never work because I know two communists and they don't work. So, <laughs> so, and so he says, so communists don't work. They're just a bunch of lazy people who are expecting to get paid to to kiss the ass of the emperor, so they just go and vote for whoever the emperor, whatever Hitler wants them to vote for, they'll vote for it, and for that the the government will give them a paycheck. They get what is called welfare, so you don't have to work at all. Just just go and vote and do what the you know do what the dictator says, and you get your check at the end of the month. So go drink your beer and, and watch your TV and don't worry about it. And so it's called communism, collectivism. And so when you see that so many of these belief systems and religions and governments and all kinds of stuff is all cropped up by people, you have no idea who they were. You know, uh, Marx didn't write communism. And, and uh, you know, I, I, it's just so many different stories out there about where things started that are just not true. All you got to do is just go to the library and read what happened. And it's all there in the books. So the bottom line on all of this at the end of the day is quite simply, nothing in this world is what you think it is. 
and this is what I hope to be remembered a hundred years from today. Uh, I hope to be remembered as the guy who made it popular to understand nothing in this world works the way you think it does. Nothing. The whole world is a lie. So if you're waiting for Jesus to come back, he won't be coming back because he was never here to start with. And if you're waiting for the Lord uh, to come back, even the Vatican said, I think we made a mistake because it doesn't look like he's coming back. Well, hell, I knew that to start with. (laughs) And so when you find out who really wrote the scriptures, where did these ideas and law come from, uh, it's, it's quite a world we live in. Is there a spiritual construct to this? I think so, but uh, it's not what you think it is. It's not how you think it is. For instance, if you go to the Bible and read Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But that's not what it says in Hebrew. It doesn't say that in the original text at all. Because God is El, E-L in Hebrew is God. So you would expect, if you go and read the Hebrew Bible, that it would say, in the beginning, El created the heavens and the earth, because El is God. But it doesn't say that. It says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. What is Elohim? Elohim is simply adding an apostrophe S to a Hebrew word. And so it means, like car is C-A-R, or apostrophe S means cars more than one. Right. Okay, so therefore, if God is El, Elohim is a plural. It's like a comma and an S, a plural to the word God. So the correct term, if you read it in Hebrew, is in the beginning, the gods, more than one, the gods created the heavens and the earth. That's what the scripture says. Right. I don't care how you think it says or what you you think about God, because it's really not important what you think about God. And so what is important is what do the what does the reference works in the book say? So if you're taking all this from the Bible, well, go back and do some work on the Bible and find out what does Elohim mean? And what does the word El mean? El means God. Well, what is Elohim? Many gods. Right, plural. And that's why the Ten Commandments, when God is saying uh, to the first commandment, is, I am the Lord your God, and I shall not have foreign gods before me. Well, you go back and read it, like the rabbis told me. Go back and read it. It says, I am the Lord your God. I'm not the Lord Almighty God of the whole universe. No, I'm the Lord your God, and I will not have any other gods before me. Well, the same thing a young man can say to the girl he's uh, engaged to. You know, there are a lot of other young men out there, uh, better looking than I am and smarter than I am, but you made a deal with me. And the deal is that we have made a contract, and we're going steady, and we're getting married, so you're engaged to me. So I will not have any other. There's plenty of young men out there, but I don't want any of them before me. Right. And so God was saying to Israel, I am the Lord your God, and I will not have any other gods before me. He didn't say there weren't any. Just don't let me catch you worshiping any. And so we to- we're we told, and uh, this is another one, we're told that the Jews were the first monotheistic religion in the world. Mono meaning one. And so monotheistic means the worship of one God. And so we all know that the Jews were the first worshipers of one God. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's laughable on its face because the Jews were not monotheistic. Pharaoh Akhenaten was monotheistic. Pharaoh Akhenaten says there's only one God, period, end of sentence. It's a man that's named now Father in heaven. So there's only one God. Well, that was Pharaoh Akhenaten, not the Jews. The Jews were not monotheistic. The Jews were heno. The word is H-E-N-O, henotheistic. Look up the word henotheistic, and it means the worshipers of one God without uh, without, uh, you know, and the worshippers of one God choosing one God for many. In other words, there are many gods. You chose one in particular. And so when you chose that one, there were 15 gods, say, standing in front of you, and you picked one that you liked, and you liked him, and so he accepted uh, you 
to be his uh, to be his followers. Okay, so you have made a deal with him. So he is going to be the Lord your God. But he's not the only God. There's 14 more of them up there. But you picked one. And so to pick a God from a group is called Heno, H-E-N-O, Henotheistic. So therefore the Jews were not monotheistic. Well, we, we say, well, the other, the Jews worship one God. Yes, the one God they picked. Is that just one God in the whole universe? No, there were 14 or 15 of them, up, fool, and they picked one. So they are the worshipers of one God. Yeah, but there were 14 others you forgot about, and they were all equal. And so that's why in the book of, in the, in the, in the book of Psalms, it says that Almighty God, Jehovah, uh, Yahweh, he took his seat among the gods, the ruling, uh, the ruling uh, gods of the universe. He took his seat among the gods. Well, that implies that he's just one of them. Well, that's right. Elohim. Uh, Elohim means the gods, more than one. So therefore, the ones that the Jews are worshiping is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, a henotheistic, meaning you picked one in particular, but there's 14 more you didn't pick. So, there's a whole story about religion, theology, you know, and the word the, the word the, T-H-E in Greek is, is God. T-H-E is God. That's why you could say, well, I work for this man. The other guy said, well, I work for that man. And if I'm working for the president, I say, I work for the man. You're working for a man? No, I'm working for the man. Yeah. yeah. The means the top of the line, the best and the most powerful. That's what I'm working with. So I'm working with the, and you got, you know, you got an automobile, a Ford. Yeah, well, I got a Maserati. That's the car, Jackson. So therefore, the word the simply means God. It's the elevation of God. God is the in Greek, T-H-E, and God, a lot of Greek guys have got a name Theo, T-H-E-O. T-H-E-O is a Greek word for God. And so in, in the ancient Greek world, uh, you would go and not to church. You didn't go to church. You would go to an open air theater. This is why it was called a theater because it was called theater because it was a God show. And so you go sit at the open air theater and have a beer and bring your lunch and sit and watch uh, an actor play uh, in, the, in the open air theater in Greece. And those plays would teach you something about God, morality or justice or whatever. But those plays would teach you something about how to look at the world, and how to look at your fellow man. And so it was referred to as a theater. Theater was the as God in the show. So this is why you go to church today. It's like a theater. You get a ticket. You go in, they give you a sandwich, you drop some money in the plate, and there's a show. And then you leave, when, when the show's over, you walk out, and you feel very saintly and very holy, because it makes you feel good. Well, you do the same thing with the Cub Scouts, too. Uh, you can do the same thing with the Masons or the or the or any other religion. Or the AA. <laughs> yeah, or they go to the AA. That makes you feel good too. Right? Does it mean anything? No, it don't mean shit. But at least it, it makes you feel good. Makes yeah. you feel like it did something, and you feel holy and righteous. Yeah, but you dropped about fifty bucks on in the plate. Yeah, well, that's expected. So it's just uh, you know that's why churches are are divided into denominations. You know, like fifties and hundreds and twenties, those are all denominations. And yeah. so are churches. They're divided into denominations. It's just a business. Well, Jordan, unbelievable information. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of stuff myself that I have to uh process through. <laughs> Seriously. It yeah. was a fantastic discussion. So you need to come back and we could pick up where we left off and we could talk about oh, more stuff. To. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's always great when you're on and uh in fact, um, I told a bunch of friends on my Facebook page that, you know, you were coming on and, you know, they get, they get really excited about it because, uh, it's always going to be very, very good information. It's always educational. So I want to thank you for that. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I always try and say, I'm saying a little late in this conversation, but I always try and say I'm not the world's foremost authority on nothing. Period. I don't consider myself to be a foremost authority on anything. 
Uh, why? It's because at least after 77 years of life, I am finally wise enough to know how much I don't know and how much I don't know. But I'm fascinated with the dark side of the world I live in, the real secrets, what's really going on on the planet Saturn that you don't know nothing about, what's really going on under the earth in the, in the caverns of this earth that you never heard anything about and don't know what the military is doing down there. Uh, when you look at the out-of-place artifacts, things that have been found miles and miles down under the earth, the, and strato that the paleontologist will tell you was three and a half billion years old when you go down into the earth at a certain, uh, certain many miles down the, you know, the strata is, we know to be three billion years old. And then when you go down beneath, beneath that three billion year old strata and you're bringing up, uh, from your, your drilling, you're bringing up handmade artifacts and rings and, 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 uh, you know, what am I trying to say? And bracelets and all kinds of strange handmade things made out of gold and silver and copper. And they're in strata three and a half billion years old. Yeah. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out somebody was on this earth three and a half billion years ago that knew how to uh, manipulate metals and, and silver and gold and make handmade rings and trinkets and things. They're called out-of-place artifacts. Look it up in any dictionary or look it up on the web. Simple, out-of-place artifacts, meaning you're finding things in the oceans, at the bottom of the oceans, that have no business being there at all. Where did they come from? And so, I, you know, that's why that book, uh, The Complete Works of Charles Fort, is so important. That was, that I got that when I was 19 years old. And boy, that's a, that's a humdinger. You need to get that book. You can buy it in any bookstore today. It's called The Complete Works of Charles Fort, F-O-R-T. Charles Ford has a thick, thick book of all the strangest stuff that's happened on the earth that nobody has an answer to. Nobody. Nobody talks about it because nobody knows anything about it. But there's been all kinds of wonderful and off the wall strange things being found and things happening, uh, that nobody knows how it happened. Nobody knows why it happened. So nobody talks about it. Well, Charles Ford talked about it. And then he begins to tell you all kinds of things that have happened in this world that are absolutely outrageous and unbelievable. And then he also shows you that nobody has ever commented on it. Nobody. Yeah. Why? Because nobody knows what they're talking about. You know, and uh, it's, it's fascinating. And one, one story I remember from from the book was he was talking about in the 1860s, I think, in London, back in those, back in those days. Uh, in 1800s, uh, in, in London, it snowed very, a lot of snow all over the city of London. But the, the next morning, according to the newspapers and magazine articles, they said the next morning, there was found little tiny footsteps, uh, about an inch and a half to two inches long and about a half inch deep in the snow that started from one far extreme uh, position in, 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 in London and walked all the way across London in one straight line, a little footsteps in the snow. Nobody knew what in the hell is that little footsteps that went from one side of the great city of London to the other. And what was really interesting is that on the path, it would not veer off the straight path. It was a, like a laser straight line. And if it came up to a house or a tree or a car or anything, it would go over it. And you could see the footprints going up the side of the house, across the roof and back down on the roof and then go back down and go straight. And it walked straight across London from one side of that big city to the other in the snow. And the little footsteps were like a, a, an inch and a half to two inches long. And it was only about a half inch deep, so you could tell about how much this little creature would weigh. And nobody has ever commented on that. Scientists will not comment on it. Nobody wants to talk about it. Why? Because scientists are stupid enough to know, if you don't know what caused it, then shut up. You don't know from nothing. 
You get a PhD and don't even know what the hell is going on in your own city. So this is why I'm not impressed with people with PhDs and doctors because nobody reads and nobody knows anything that's going on. And the people who do have the PhDs and doctors by their name, they are so profoundly ignorant. They don't read. They don't know. All they know is they, they learn what to answer the questions in college, and they answer the questions correctly, and then they got a, a work permit. It's called a diploma. And so then they graduate, which is two words, gradually indoctrinate. And so they graduate, and they got a square mortar board, which represents the planet Saturn. And this bullshit goes on all day long, <laughs> forever. All kinds of strange, silly stuff yeah. in this world that people don't know anything about. I've just been enjoying myself and, uh, and entertaining myself, reading all of the lunacy of the world and what goes on in the world that you don't know anything about. And what, what all these signs and symbols mean, there's just an extraordinary story of betrayal of the human race. We are so ignorant that we're bored. We need to have alcohol and, 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 and television and, and sitcoms and something to entertain you and keep you busy. Why? Because you don't have a brain at all. Your brain is dead. It died many, many years ago. We just didn't tell you. So you can't think. You don't know how to read. You don't know how to understand. If you did read something, you wouldn't know what it meant. And so you're just bored. You're bored to tears. Why? Because you don't know what's going on. Yeah. And the best part is you don't want to know. Yeah. That's even better. Yeah. And that concludes another Sage of Quay interview, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests, websites, and social media are listed in the show notes below. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can get to the blog by typing in sageofquayradio.blogspot.com or simply head over to our hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laboroflovemusic.com to listen to my album, Leaving Dystopia. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.